So first, I have some uh, conditions about photographs and recordings. Please do not put any photographs in which I appear into Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. Those are three tentacles of the same surveillance monster. Uh, Facebook does not have users, it has useds. <laughs> Facebook knows how to recognize people in photos from their faces or the backs of their heads. So if you put a photo into Facebook in which a person appears, you are helping the monster track that person. It's a bad way to treat your friends, and please don't do it to me. <laughs> Second, <clears throat> which means turn that off. In Android, in the parameters of the camera application, you can find a parameter to turn that off. In an eye monster, I believe there's a setting under privacy. <clears throat> and in general, get 100% ready to take the photo before you approach me about taking the photo. Please make efficient use of my time because I have a lot of work to do today other than this talk. And with regard to recordings, it's okay if you make an audio or video recording, but if you want to distribute copies, please do so only in formats that work with free software. Test it first. <laughs> then make sure the distribution site works with free software. So don't put it in YouTube or Vimeo. Those sites require people to run non-free software to see anything. If you visit a YouTube page in a browser and you don't run the non-free JavaScript code that it sends, you will see a blank window. In Vimeo, you'll see everything except the video. That's the way YouTube was before. So don't do that. Don't distribute videos of my talks that way. Distribute, it in sites, distribute them in sites that treat the user's freedom with respect. And finally, please put on the recordings the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because this is not a technically useful work. This is a presentation of a point of view. So, <clears throat> This is not a talk about free software, not in general. But I want to start with part of a free software presentation to lead up to the relevance of free software to this issue. Because I came to the issue of fighting surveillance out of my campaign for software that respects our freedom. And indeed, software that doesn't respect our freedom is a one of the primary means of surveilling people, but not the only one. So first of all, free software is software that respects users' freedom and community. We don't mean it's gratis. We're not talking about price at all. So it's uh, Libra, it's not gratis. Well, often it is, often copies may be available gratis, and sometimes they're not, but that's a, a side issue. It's a little detail, a practical detail which is not what we're concerned with. We're only concerned with whether, once you have the program, does it respect your freedom or does it crush your freedom? Does it respect your community or does it attempt to carve up and divide your community? These are important ethical issues. Who pays who, how much to whom is not a major ethical issue as for things that are not necessities of life. So, <clears throat> what is a program and what is a computer? Well, a computer is a universal computing engine, but it only does a very simple thing, conceptually simple at least, which is get the next instruction and do what that says. And get the next instruction and do what that says. And the next one and the next one, millions of times a second, it will get an instruction and carry out what that instruction says. 
the instructions come from a program. Depending on what instructions that program has, it will make the computer, the same computer, do this or that or the other thing or anything, anything at all within the range of what computers can do. So there are things computers can't do and no program can make the computer do that. But considering the things the computer can do, the right program will make it do any of those things by, based on which instructions it gives to the computer. So the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you when really it's someone else. You might think your computer obeys you when really it's always obeying its true master. And its true master decides when it's permitted to carry out your requests and when it's not. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other because there's no other way it can be. When the users control the program, that's free software. Why so? Well, what is freedom? Freedom means having control of your own life, control of the activities that you do in your life. Well, if you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity calls for control of the program you're using to do it. So when the users control the program, that program respects the user's freedom and community, so it's free software. In practical terms, in order for users to have control of the program, they need the four essential freedoms. So these four essential freedoms are the practical criterion for a free program. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it so that it does your computing activities the way you wish. Now, why do we insist on source code? Here you can see some source code. It's a mixture of English and math. If you've learned that language, you can read and understand the source code and then change it so it will do something different. To run it, we typically turn it into an executable. Hmm, something's strangely... Oh, oh well. Uh, the executable is a bunch of enigmatic ones and zeros, which, if it's that short, it's not that hard to figure it out. But when it gets to be more of them, figuring out what they mean gets to be a big job. And for a real program, which might have millions of ones and zeros, figuring out what the executable means is a tremendously hard job that people don't even try, except as a desperate last recourse. So if all the users get is the executable, Practically speaking, they don't have the option of changing it, and therefore it's not free software. So these two freedoms together give us separate control over the program. Here we see four users, each one separately using this program, but one of them is exercising freedom one by changing it. Separate control means I'm free to change my copies and you're free to change your copies and you're free to change your copies. But while that's essential, it's not enough because most of the users are not programmers. Most users don't know how to study and change source code because that's not their field. That's not something they learned. It's not something you have a talent for. They do other things. And it's fine that people are not programmers. There are lots of other interesting or, and useful things to do in, the, in life. But they do have deserve they control of their own computing. How can people who aren't programmers participate in control of what the programs do through collective control, which means 
the freedom for users to work together to exercise control over what the program does. At the top, we see a group of three users that are working together to exercise control over this program. The two on the right are changing the code. They must be programmers. The one on the left is not changing the code. Person may not know how to program, or maybe person does know how, but isn't doing so in this case. But this user does participate in control over that program through the discussions that the group has about what changes to make. The ones who cooperate in this way are those who choose to. At the bottom, there are two more users who are not working with those three. Why not? Could be any reason. Or maybe they don't know each other. Maybe tomorrow they'll decide to work together. Or maybe not. Because each one of them is free to cooperate with others or not. <clears throat> Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. With these two freedoms, the group can cooperate. If some user in the group makes a modified version, version person can use freedom three, under freedom three, make copies of that version and distribute them to others in the group. Then any of them through freedom two can make more copies and redistribute them to others in the group. <clears throat> but the group does not have to have a formal existence or a list of members and freedoms two and three are not limited to members of any particular group. You could distribute copies to anyone. You can even offer copies to the general public, which means publishing that version. This is legitimate. It's part of the freedom you've got to have. So when the program carries these four freedoms thoroughly and adequately, then it's free software because the users control the program both singly and collectively, and therefore it respects their freedom. But if one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, then the users don't control the program. Instead, the program controls the users, and the program's owner or developer controls the program. So this program is an instrument of unjust power for power of the developer or owner over the users of the program. This is why a non-free program is inherently unjust. It shouldn't exist. There shouldn't be non-free software because every non-free program subjugates its users. So because of this, you shouldn't participate in developing non-free programs. That's making the world a worse place. It's better to do nothing at all than develop non-free software. Because if you develop non-free software, you're harming people, taking away their freedom. If you do nothing, at least you're not doing any harm. Now, one curious, very common special case that people sometimes guess wrong about is, what if you write a program yourself and you use it yourself without ever distributing a copy? Well, in this case, there's only one user, and all one users have the four freedoms, so it's free software. Likewise, if a company develops some software and uses it internally without ever releasing it, it's free software in this trivial way. Non-free software begins when the developer distributes a copy to some other user but without the four freedoms. That puts the other user under the developer's power. And this is the injustice we're trying to stop. Now, this basic injustice that the developer has power over the users 
corrupts the developer. Power corrupts, and this power is no different. The developer generally feels the temptation to try to make use of that power to gain more power or mistreat the users for its own advantage. which means putting malicious functionalities into the program. So spying is a very common kind of malicious functionality. This example is the Amazon swindle. <laughs> it's Amazon's ebook reader, which is designed to swindle users out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, it spies completely. Everything the user does is reported to Amazon. Uh, the title of the book is reported to Amazon. If, uh, so even if the book was obtained from someplace other than Amazon, Amazon still knows what book is being read. And it sends the page number being read. If a user highlights any text or enters any notes, they're sent to Amazon. <clears throat> but spying is very common in non-free programs. The five widely used proprietary operating systems, that means Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, they all spy on the user and transmit various personal information, different depending on which system. Flash Player has a functionality that enables websites to recognize the user. They're sometimes called super cookies. <clears throat> and uh, lots of apps also spy. Even the Flashlight app in phones spies. Now you might wonder, why does it need to communicate over the internet to turn on the lamp? What information does it need? None. It's communicating only for spying. That's the only possible reason it could com be communicating. But lots of, of apps spy. Someone studied the hundreds of most popular Android apps and found that more than half of them were spying in an obviously detectable way. The rest, maybe they're spying too, but not in the most detectable way. And uh, of course, streaming apps, such as Spotify and Netflix, they make users identify themselves and then keep track of what the users listen to or watch. This is the nastiest conceivable kind of surveillance, surveillance of what people listen to or watch. It's like the Amazon swindle that surveils what people read. Now, this ought to be a crime. They should go into prison for setting up such things. And then there are the, well, so for this reason I say, out, out, damned Spotify. I won't listen to something through Spotify or watch something through Netflix, even if it's on someone else's computer. Because of course, I won't have a non-free program on my computer, so I couldn't possibly run it myself. But even if someone else were running it, the idea tracking what people watch. The idea that something such as Netflix or Spotify is allowed to exist makes me so angry that I have no wish to listen to or watch whatever it is. I'd rather refuse. And then there are the transportation apps such as Goober, I call it Goober because it pays drivers peanuts, which is another reason to condemn it. But the direct injustice it does to customers is tracking pe where people go. Now, I will use an ordinary taxi because 
it doesn't know who I am. And I pay cash, I don't identify myself. Goober won't take cash, and Goober requires you to identify yourself and run a non-free program to ask for transportation. That means I will never be a customer of Goober. But Goober runs at a loss trying to eliminate its competition. It behooves us not to wait until that is successful before we say how bad it is. We've got to start fighting back now. We have to campaign to get rid of Goober and any other companies that do the same wrongs to, to their customers. We have to campaign proactively to get rid of those companies just as they're campaigning proactively to get rid of the ethical alternatives. Now, many products that are manufactured with non-free software also spy on users. They're tethered to servers. The Fitbit is a good example of this. It sends data to the company's, the manufacturer's server. It sends the user's personal data there, and then the company invites the user to buy it back. What goal? But this is, has become standard practice in the Internet of Stings. Products that are tethered to a particular server run by the manufacturer, so it knows everything. Think about it, if you have a thermostat that you talk to through the manufacturer's server, or a camera Wi-Fi device that talks that you talk to through the manufacturer's server. Or, these things exist. Uh, there's even a sex toy, an internet-controlled sex toy that allows somebody who is not present to send it commands. Now, that might conceivably be an enjoyable thing. <laughs> but when I saw it, in a store, my first thought was, this is meant to spy on people. And indeed, people discovered that at least one such toy was spying on people. Because to send it commands, you had to go through the manufacturer's server. So it would know, the manufacturer would know everything. And not only that, they designed the product specifically to spy on people. They put in a thermometer. Now, why does a sex toy need a thermometer? Last time you used a vibrator, did, you, did it have a temperature gauge? I mean, did you care? You had no reason to care. The point is, the manufacturer wanted to know when the product was in contact with a human body. And a, thermos, a thermometer gave them that information. Well, I think that I, sus I speculate that the manufacturer could also tell what kind of contact was being made with the human body from the thermometer. So I was, my suspicions were proved right. Be suspicious of any device that is meant to talk to users through the manufacturer's server. That is malware in itself. Uh, don't allow it into your house. <clears throat> there was a comedian who joked, uh, a woman came up to me and said, uh, did I see you on TV? And I told her, sorry, we can't see out from the other side. <laughs> Except that now, with a so-called smart TV, they can. They're totally vicious things. I wouldn't allow one in my house. <clears throat> and some of them are listening as well. Oh, there's a home security camera that was designed for the user to 
watch through it through the manufacturer's server. And at one, or maybe originally the, the user could watch it directly, but at some point the manufacturer made changes and users, the user could only watch it by making an account on the manufacturer's server, which means that the manufacturer was watching everything in the user's house that the user could watch. You've got to expect non-free software nowadays to be malicious. Now these are just some examples of the malicious functionalities we see. <coughs> There's also digital restrictions management, DRM, where they design products to restrict the user. There are back doors. The Amazon Swindle has a back door for remote erasure of books which was used in 2009 to erase thousands of copies of 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> I mean, if I were writing fiction, I wouldn't have dared to put that in. It would, have, it would not have been plausible. It just happens to have been true. Now, Imagine what a back door would do in a driverless car. Imagine if they used the back door to tell the car to go to secret police headquarters with the doors locked. Now you can be sure that China will do this. We can expect that some other countries such as Russia and Turkey will do this. Uh, Will the U.S. do this? Could we really say we're, we're confident it won't? I don't think so. We must regard any driverless car with a back door as terribly dangerous. Not just dangerous to oneself, but dangerous to democracy. And we, they're already designing the back door. I posted a link to an article about a company that's designing the software for remote control driving. That's part of the plan. It's not mere speculation. It's not a mere possibility. It's part of the plan to make these into uh, traps for the secret police. And then there's censorship of apps Apple pioneered this. Apple used to practice its censorship power arbitrarily for its own commercial and political interests until about a year ago, China ordered Apple to block VPN applications. And Apple found it was compelled to obey China and censor for China. If Apple had made the iMonsters like all previous computers where users could install the applications of their choice, then Apple would have had a response to China. But China, we can't control what users install. I, I'm sorry, we, we would, I, I, would just, I would love to do what you want, but I have no ability, please forgive me. But because Apple gave itself that power, it had no response except to start censoring for China. And then there is the universal back door. Windows has a universal back door since Windows XP. Uh, it was discovered in Windows XP that Microsoft could change the software remotely at any time. Microsoft would not admit this, but with Windows Vista, Microsoft proudly announced this universal backdoor under a nice sounding name. Instead of calling it a universal backdoor, it called it auto upgrade, or auto downgrade, depending on your opinion of the change that's forced on you. We also know of universal backdoors in the Amazon Swindle, in the Wii U. I suspect that some 
smart TVs have universal back doors, but the home security camera had a universal back door. There is even pressure for companies to send security upgrades, meaning to put in a universal back door and use it to change the software. Now, I think it's fine if a product has the ability to receive security upgrades from somebody of your choice. And then you could set it up to receive those f to one of the various companies that has chosen to maintain the free software in the product. This is a way we could get the security, the general level of security of devices improved without giving anybody intolerable power over anybody. Now often you find many malicious functionalities together. For instance, Netflix keeps track of what users are watching. It makes a, a dossier for each user. Now this is intolerable, it should be illegal. In addition, it implements DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, and it requires users to sign an anti-socializing contract. What does that mean? It's also known as an uh, end user license agreement. Uh, but the reason I call it anti-socializing is that it's the opposite of what we want schools and parents to do to children. We speak of socializing them, teaching them to be good to other people, to be helpful and cooperate with others. This contract is the exact opposite. A user agreeing to this contract promises not to share copies, meaning be a bad member of society, not to lend the one copy to anybody else, meaning be an even worse member of society, and not to give that copy to anybody else, meaning be an even worse member of society. You can also call it a jerk-making contract, because it's a contract that pressure, where people promise to be jerks, and unfortunately, some of them will actually go through with it. Now, if you have agreed to such a contract, that is no excuse for being a jerk. Your obligations for being a good member of society are unchanged. You have to break the contract. But I don't like agreeing to a contract that I know I will be morally obligated to break, so I don't agree with, to them. I check. If anything wants that, I don't agree. <clears throat> So, uh, in gnu.org slash malware, you can find hundreds of examples of malicious functionalities in proprietary programs. Oh, and I didn't mention some of the worst in, in portable phones. Every portable phone reports where it is. Every few minutes it sends out a signal so that the phone towers can receive it and know how to communicate with the phone. Now this, wasn't, this functionality wasn't set up for malicious tracking. It's necessary for the system to work. And tracking is just a byproduct, but it's still unacceptable. But even worse, the processor that talks to the radio network, the modem processor, generally has a universal back door with which they can change the software and convert it into a listening device that listens full time and transmits all the conversations it hears. And, if, and you don't have to speak right into the microphone because remember it has speakerphone functionality. It can turn that on anytime and listen to all the conversations in the room and transmit them. In fact, if there's anybody here who's carrying a portable tracking and surveillance device, it could be listening to my talk right now. Not that I mind, this talk's going to be posted anyway. Uh, anybody's welcome, as far as I'm concerned, to listen to it. But keep in mind that your private conversations could be listened to this way as well. Now, 
there is a plan to develop a phone that will resist these malicious things as much as is possible. So the microphone won't be connected to the modem processor. It'll be connected to the application processor, which is the computer that runs a free operating system. And uh, in that machine, it will be a free operating system. So uh, if, if things are working well, you'll be able to stop them from turning it into a listening device. And there will also be a, a switch to turn off the power to the modem processor so you can be sure it's off. An ordinary mobile phone doesn't have an off switch. It has a button you can push which says, oh, sir telephone, please be so kind as to turn yourself off. And then maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. So this phone will be better, but there's one thing there's no way to stop, and that is if it doesn't send out signals for where to to find it every so often, there's no way the network can send calls or messages to you. And you, But if you have it off so people can't send calls or messages to you, it's not very useful. I've only thought of one way to make it acceptable to use a portable phone, to make a, have a portable phone such that there'd be a way that I could make it useful without having it be tracking me. And that is keep it off almost all the time and carry a one-way pager so people could inform me when they're trying to reach me and that way I could judge based on what they said in the pager uh, when, how, how urgent it is, and I could determine when I should turn the phone on and thus reveal my location. I'm not sure one-way pagers exist anymore. I mean, I, I heard a rumor recently that they don't. They do. Oh, good. Well, then maybe I'll actually get one. Uh, it would be interesting to say, see, here's what I have, the phone and the pager, and this is how I made it possible for me to have a portable phone that isn't intolerably surveilling me. It would be nice if every portable phone, if there were a standard one-way paging system and every phone could come with that as well. It could be built in. It would be much cheaper that way. Anyway, we've got hundreds of examples of this. If you're using proprietary software, you're almost certainly using proprietary malware. And there's a poem that, I'm think that I'd like to read to you. Uh, so this is called, What Mary Had. Uh, maybe you can actually read it off that. Mary had a little lamp in a mo with a, on a motion sensing switch. And this at night, when Mary moved, highlighted every twitch. Mary had a little phone that tracked her everywhere. And every word that Mary spoke, the state was sure to hear. Mary had a little car with cellular modem built, and everywhere that car did go, her personal data spilt. Mary had a TV set that watched her watching it. A jackass cracked its back door key to photograph her tit. <laughs> They've gone too far, cried Mary's rage, when a TV set is lewd. That's how she learned with non-free code, there's mischief being brewed. Need I describe her watch, her stove, her fridge, her thermostats? They're all like smart booby traps laid out by plutocrats. 
Mary trashed those networked things. Her software now is free. She fights for freedom night and day, so free we all can be. And uh, you can find that on stallman.org, I believe. So, uh, <clears throat> non-free software is one of the primary means of tracking and surveilling people, but it is not the only one. Digital services often track people because to use them you have to give data and then they probably demand some other general personal data just because they can. Uh, and as a result, they're collecting lots of data about people. You can still pay for the New York City subway anonymously, but they're trying to make it so convenient to give them a bank card, and then they know who you are and where you get on. And then Amtrak is even worse. Uh, you can't buy a ticket on Amtrak without showing ID. They shouldn't have any right to demand ID from people. They shouldn't have a right to identify people except based on specific need. <clears throat> now, even if Uber communicated with your, with your browser and you could use a free browser, it would still demand that you identify yourself and you'd still have to pay in a way that identified you. So your own software would not be snooping on you, but the Uber server would be, and that has the same result, that it would make a, a dossier of your movements. <clears throat> ISPs track people. Now this became, people became more aware of this when the bullshitters men canceled the rule about how the ISP could make use of this information. But limiting how the, for instance, it couldn't be used to, to advertise, but it was still there and it could be used in other ways. So the regulation that they got rid of didn't protect people. It just, was a, it, it just slightly limited the harm that could be done with that information that they shouldn't be collecting at all. Likewise, phone companies keep track of who you call and who calls you. They keep track of your location. If you're carrying a, a portable phone, it's sending a location signal, a localization signal every few minutes, and they're keeping track of it. One of the first things we learned from Snowden's revelations is that uh, AT&T, I believe it was, was, or was some phone, long distance company in the US was telling the US government about every call that was made and had been doing so for something like 20 years. It's more light this way. So, Protecting us from surveillance includes limiting what those services can collect. And of course, there are also systems that exist purely to track people, such as the license plate recognition cameras that track movement of cars, and face recognition cameras, maybe now, that track people around the city. Now those are systems that we don't use at all. They exist only to track us. In the case of non-free software that surveils us, we can protect ourselves by rejecting the non-free software. But 
with the systems we don't own, we can't solve the problem that way. Uh, the ISPs, computer, uh, the cable companies, com computers, the phone companies, computers and the phone exchange, they don't belong to us. Maybe they're running free software, but they're not running our copies. They're running the company's copies. I hope that they, are, they are running free software. That company should have control of its own computing too. Uh, I hope that your phone company has not made the stupid mistake of running non-free software controlled by some other company, but that has no effect on whether it can mistreat us. We can't protect ourselves from those kinds of surveillance individually. We have to do it politically. We have to organize to put an end to massive surveillance. Now, <clears throat> massive surveillance has gone farther than you might even realize. I believe it's Detroit where the cops have invited businesses to set up cameras that the cops can watch through at any time. Basically suggesting if you don't do this, 911 calls will come slow, 911 response will be slow. So you better let us spy on your customers. It should be illegal for them to spy on anybody's customers that way. It should be illegal to set up such a feed that's available to anyone but yourself. Not looking at a place where the public is admitted. In the inside of your house, if you want to, okay. But in a store where the public is invited to come and buy, that should be, that should be a crime to spy on them like that. And then there are some places where they've set up uh, there, there was a town I read where they set up cameras looking at certain parts of the town on a public feed and said to everybody, watch through this, looking for any possible crimes. Now the people who live around there don't like it because they're being watched all the time by they don't know who. We can't protect ourselves from surveillance one by one. Well, there's a certain amount you can do. I run Tor to browse and also to connect to the FSF server so that it can't be told where I am coming from. So that, that protects me from one kind of surveillance. And of course, communicating through SSH, I'm protected from some other kinds of surveillance, but, <clears throat> but that's only partial. The only way we can recover our privacy is by organizing for legislation. And when we design this legislation, we have to look at the problem scenarios we need to avoid and then ask, would these policies succeed in preventing the problems? What we would find is that most of the remedies being proposed don't come anywhere near doing the job. Basically, the people proposing them are not starting from a problem to be solved, or if they are, it's a problem only of the sort of profiling for advertisements. But they tend to make the mistake of assuming that it's only bad to profile people if they don't give consent. But actually, that's a completely inadequate criterion. Because businesses have become expert at manufacturing consent. Now that's a joke, of course. I'm uh, copying a phrase from Chomsky, but he was talking about a different kind of consent. I'm talking about consent for your personal data to be collected. Businesses are expert at manufacturing that kind of consent. All they have to do is say, in order to have this service, you have to give us this personal data, and you want this service, right? You can't live without it. Your friends have it. How could you possibly live without it? 
Your friends won't like you anymore. So people consent. If we want to stop this profiling, we have to propose a solution that's adequate to actually stop it. And that solution takes the form, companies, you're not allowed to ask for these data. We have to be firm and strict with them. We have to say, no, you can't ask for this data. You can't collect this data. You want to offer people rides? No, you can't ask who they are. You can't keep track of who goes where. You can't recognize the faces of people on the street. So we have to look at the problems that we need to prevent and then design solutions that are adequate to do the job. So what are the problems? Well, one problem, as we now know, is profiling people, which makes people, victim, makes people vulnerable to various kinds of advertising manipulation. We have discovered that this made it possible for Russia to manipulate the US election, to manipulate the UK's referendum on leaving the European Union. Uh, it's basically, it makes society vulnerable. But it's not only vulnerable to Russia, of course. Russia is just one party that took advantage of this. Lots of businesses are taking advantage of this. Planet roasters, the billionaires that want to destroy civilization by stopping us from curbing global heating until we're doomed, they're taking advantage of it too. They have lots of money to spend. And they're spending it in every way they can think of to achieve this goal. So <clears throat> I put it to you that we need to put an end to those systems of profiling, or at least make sure that they are not suitable or, or available for this kind of use, no matter by whom, doesn't matter whether it's Russia. Forget for the moment uh, that, it, that Russia was one of them. It's just as bad if it's, uh, John Q. Billionaire. <clears throat> Another threat is the threat to whistleblowers, which means, again, a threat to democracy. Democracy means that the people control the state's actions. But in order to control them, we have to know what they are. States have a habit of acting secretly and concealing what they're doing. How do we know what the state's doing? Thanks to whistleblowers who tell us. But the state tends to call the whistleblower a traitor or a spy and put the whistleblower in prison if it can identify the whistleblower. And how can it identify the whistleblower? Through massive surveillance. So, we need to make sure the surveillance it does not enable the state to identify whistleblowers. If the state knows who goes where and who talks with whom, then it can identify the whistleblower reliably. Therefore, we need <clears throat> to make sure that databases do not collect who goes where and who talks with whom. But how can we stop this? Well, the usual proposals are to regulate the use of the data once collected. But we know that that won't do the job. And the reason is that the state can either ignore these regulations or put a loophole into them. It'll say, it, for instance, the 
regulations will surely say that the state can use the data to find criminals, and by accusing the whistleblower of, of a crime, that's an, if that's an excuse, the state can now look at all the data and identify the whistleblower. So that won't do the job. We need to make sure that the database doesn't have the data that would be required to identify the whistleblowers, which means we need to regulate not the use of the data, but the collection and the accumulation of the data. If the data is not being accumulated now, then there's no way the state can find a whistleblower today. Of course, a tyrannical state could always change these laws and start collecting data, but it would only get data from that point on. There's nothing we can do by laws that would prevent a tyrannical state willing and able to change laws from arising in the future. But if we can legislate today that they can't have systems which are collecting data about people, then even if next year a tyrannical state decides to throw this away, it won't have data about this year. So that's what we need to do. But to make it a bit harder, we can legislate that the systems be designed in such a way that they don't collect any data they could possibly not collect. The law has to say, if there is any way you could do this job without collecting personal data or without collecting more than this much personal data, then you must design the system to do it that way. Minimizing the amount of data collected has to be an overriding priority when it comes to selecting how the system should work. In March, I went to France and I visited a city where to pay to park, you must punch in your license plate number in the parking meter. So their parking system is a total surveillance system. There are parking lots in the UK which work the same way. I read about this because they were also cheating people and people were complaining to the newspaper. But uh, what, when I read that, my thought was, the worst thing about this is that it's keeping track of who parked there. Now, governments may have laws about the use of data once that's been collected, but they tend to throw these laws away precipitously whenever there's a convenient terrorist attack. So the US, after uh, September 2001, passed the Pat Riot Act, which says that the FBI, I'm not willing to call that law patriotic. It's the opposite of patriotic for an American. <clears throat> the Pat Riot Act, or sometimes I call it the USAP at Riot Act, because uh, that's its full name, you see. Uh, it's an acronym. The name is an acronym. And so where to divide this list of letters up into words is entirely arbitrary anyway. So that law says the FBI can collect essentially any database of personal data just by saying we want it. No need even for a court order. <clears throat> I say that laws should, res should uh, forbid surveillance systems ex and forbid the collection of data except in specific times and places when a court orders collection. Because you, you have to have that possibility because we want the state to investigate crimes and catch criminals. But we don't want the systems to provide what adds up to massive surveillance. So the court should have to allow surveillance over here. Or else not, there's not allowed to be surveillance over here. So... <clears throat> Uh, 
<clears throat> so the point is, parking lots and cities should not be allowed to set up parking payment systems that keep track of who's there. Those systems should be forbidden. They should have to do it some other way, even if it costs a little more and is not quite so convenient. We know that those systems can work. They existed. They were used 20, even 50 years ago. By the way, did you know that the Greeks had a goddess of parking? If you parked in an unlucky place, you had to make an offering to Demeter. <clears throat> now, one way we can protect from massive surveillance is by not centralizing the data. Consider the kind of security cameras that we used uh, say 30 years ago. You put up a camera, it makes a recording someplace nearby uh, on a physical device. If a crime happens, then you go there and you copy the recording. Otherwise, it gets overwritten after some weeks automatically. Now, the work that would be involved in copying all those recordings regularly all the time is so great that it won't be done. As a result, those security cameras did not lead to massive surveillance. They were safe as regards surveillance, but they did provide some useful security. Now consider an internet-connected camera that can be watched by the state all the time or whenever it wants to. Maybe it's going to a fusion center. Uh, maybe they're making a recording. Maybe they can search that recording for faces any time they want. You see, once the, once the video goes off the site, once the camera is connected to any kind of network or means to transmit the video to someplace else, you can't be sure it won't be recorded there. So I would say let's legislatively require that these cameras only make a local recording. Get ourselves some security against crimes without exposing ourselves to massive surveillance. What about face recognition or license plate recognition systems? There is some justification for license plate recognition systems if we make them safe. How can we do that? We have to legislate which license plates they can see. There should be a list of license plates which are being sought. And how does a plate get in there? A court order puts it in there. So then you can have any number of license plate recognizing cameras you like, as long as they can only recognize the plate numbers that are in that database, or invalid plates. Because basically, if the camera sees a crime, like driving with an invalid license plate, it's OK if it recognizes that. So the point is this way. Uh, if somebody who the court hasn't ordered a search for, if some car like that isn't being sought drives by, the camera will say, what, car? I don't see a car. There's no car there. But if somebody who's being sought by court order drives by, the camera will see it and will uh, send out an alarm or whatever. This way, again, we have a system that provides security but does not contribute to massive surveillance. But we have to be careful. We don't want them to be able to put every government employee's license plate into that database. It's got to be done by court order based on some grounds for suspicion. And we don't want them putting in every reporter's license plate either. Because that's exactly the sort of thing that they will do. 
Uh, if they can put a, a, a government employee together with a reporter, they can suspect a whistleblower. What about face recognition itself? We need to limit the video feeds and we need to limit the faces that can go in the database. So faces to go in the face recognition database, they should only go in there by court order. So yeah, they can put in the faces of criminals being sought. And that's it. But also the video has to be limited because just having a, enough people watching all the videos leads to an oppressive panopticon state. So we need, to, we need the legislation about the cameras and about face recognition. Now these laws have to apply to the systems no matter who runs them, whether it's a company, a person, or a government. They should all be covered. <clears throat> Working this way, we can make systems that don't massively surveil. Now, there are some systems which are a bit tricky. For instance, what about borrowing books from a library? Well, the library only needs to know who borrowed the book if the book is overdue. Until the book is overdue, it doesn't have to care. So here's an idea I suggested. When somebody borrows a book, encrypt it and send it to a company in some other country that will keep it and will send it back to the library at a certain date when the book is overdue. Except that if the book comes in, the library sends to that company, the book came in, forget about that book. And this way, it won't be possible for the state to come in and take the list of all borrowing records. What about uh, bicycles for hire? Uh, if the bicycles have a dock, it's possible to design a system so that they don't know, so that it checks that the person with a valid card to use the bicycles is there taking the bicycle out. But such that if the bicycle gets returned anywhere, that sends a message around the network so that every, so that the place, the dock where the bicycle was borrowed initially finds out the bicycle was returned and then it forgets. But if the bicycle doesn't get returned, eventually the dock where it was borrowed from says, bicycle number such and such has not, got, has not been returned, it's missing, and so and so is the one who borrowed it. So decentralizing data and arranging not to centralize it except in the cases where it really needs to be centralized if that's a small fraction of cases, if those are unusual situations where something's going wrong, well, this way you can avoid putting any data into the central database uh, when things are operating correctly and normally. Now, there would still occasionally be information about some people's actions but it would be a small enough fraction of the use that it wouldn't be effective for any kind of massive surveillance. So it's not harmful. In other words, we don't need to reduce the collection of personal data to exactly zero. We need to keep it small enough that it isn't dangerous. We need to have less surveillance than we had in the Soviet Union. So, oh, uh-oh.
So I see that my robe and halo have still not arrived. Oh, oh yes. Because I figured it might be fun to present to you my other identity. And then have the auction. I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as an extensible text editor that I had written, which then became a way of life for many users as they had extended it so much they could do all their computing inside Emacs without ever, le without ever leaving it. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs. I'm sad to say it appears that the news group has ceased to be used. It used to be used for posting various kinds of wordplay. And if you start using it for that again, it would be so nice. I never saw it myself because I've never read net news in any fashion. <clears throat> you see, with so much work to do, there were just various areas of activities that I chose not to get involved with, in, with at all, and that meant I didn't have to learn how to do them. So much time saved. <clears throat> In the Church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. Then if you become a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant a portion of our sacred scriptures, that is to say the system source code. In the Church of Emacs, we have eliminated the priesthood of technology because everyone is welcome to read our sacred scriptures. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which means anyone who has never known or used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. We also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. There is a breakaway Tibetan sect which claims that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of a script. But the mother church holds that to gain spiritual merit, you must type them by hand. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control 
or set up for your regular use, and then install a wholly free operating system. And then use and install exclusively free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> there is a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other text editor VI. So people occasionally ask whether, according to the Church of Emacs, the use of VI is a sin. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. A few years ago, I visited China and some VI users proposed to attack me. I was shocked, but apparently violence begins with VI. <laughs> People occasionally ask whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo but it was a computer disk in a previous life. So, thank you. Now it's time for the auction. So here is an adorable GNU that needs a home. And this is an adorable book that needs a home. <laughs> so I'm gonna auction basically whichever one you prefer. So if you win the auction, you choose. <clears throat> Now, if you win whichever one you buy, I will sign. <clears throat> if you have a penguin at home, you need a GNU for your penguin. There should never be a penguin without a GNU. And uh, <clears throat> we can accept payment uh, in cash, with a check, with a bank card, or if, if the bank card can make phone purchases. And we can accept payment through Bitcoin if you have something here to make the payment with. <clears throat> when you bid, well, I, I can't see you if you're far away. Unfortunately, there's not enough light here. So I hope you will come closer if you're thinking of bidding. Uh, I invite you to move up now so that I can see you. Uh, and when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount as loud as you can because I have some hearing problems and if you speak quietly, I won't know what you said. I may not even know that you said anything. Uh, so I'll start with $25. Do I get $25 for the adorable GNU or the adorable book? I've got, do I get 30? Who said that? $40. Who, are you in the back, are you saying $40? $40. Okay, I've got, what? $50. I've got 50, do I get 55? $55. I've got 55, do I get 60? 60. Who's saying 60? Wave your arm. 66. I've got 60. 66. I've got 66. <laughs> do I get 70? I've got 66, do I get 70, what? Do I get 70 for this adorable? Good. Are you saying 75? I've got 75, do I get 80? Who say that, wave your arms, who's saying that? Who? I don't see the person, you're, you're, 
what? 90. 90. I've got 90. Do I get 100? 100 for this adorable GNU? 100. Who said 100? You 100? I've got, I've got 100. Do I get 110 for this adorable? What? 140. I've got 140. Do I get 150 for this adorable book? 150 for this adorable GNU? I've got 140. Do I get 150? 150 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Last chance to bid 150 or more. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 140. Which one do you want? What? Okay. And how do you wish to pay? Okay. Uh, want to hand over some cash? <laughs> Could, could you act as intermediary so, to save you from having to move? I can't hear you. Okay. To pay with a credit card, you should write all of the card data on a piece of paper <laughs> and then bring them both. We don't have that computer to handle card transactions. We put it in as a phone purchase. But it works. So um, at this point, I can answer some questions. I still have hearing problems. If you don't speak loud, I can't tell you said anything. The mic's not on. Ah. Well, ah, got it. Excellent. Your idea of legislation is a really great idea. I've already written a plan for legislation and have it in the form of a bill sitting on my website. Anybody here is welcome to go out to my blog and download the bill modify it in any way, email it back, and I'll put it back on the blog. I'm sure that it's not right. I I'd really like to see it. this. Could you email me? Uh, I would be happy to. I don't have your email address. You don't? I thought everyone did. <laughs> it's rms at gnu.org. I thought everyone knew that. Cool. I will do that. Thanks. My website is Trip Elix, and I write as that. I fight the data brokers, and I know who the data brokers are. When you talk about the vehicle things that are being recorded, they're all available from TransUnion. Anybody can buy where you go for 12 bucks. If you want to know where, what is collected about all of you, you can go out to list.nextmark.com, and that is the directory of all of the sites. I find this very interesting. I'm not going to complain. Uh, Trip, T-R-I-P-E-L-I-X dot com. Keep up the good work, please, Mr. Gnu. So you're, you're talking about the license plate readers. Uh, in New Jersey, the Attorney General in 2015 change the rules for how long this data from the license plate readers needed to be kept. It, it currently needs to be kept for five years. So anytime they retain any of the license plate data, it's kept five years. And they said, you know what, maybe that's too long. So you know, if, if after two years you don't want to keep it anymore, you can pass it to the state police. And then if you get them to hold on to it for the next three, We'll, get, we'll let you off the hook, but you must keep it at least two, then you can pass it to the state police. So that's the current you know, attorney general guidance you can just find just by Googling that regulation. Um, and then, you know, it's really funny because 
Uh, there's a story in Seattle, one of the town council members was very upset when they were testing license plate readers uh, because they noticed that you know, you, you could, the public was gonna have access to this data and they could see that the town council member was at his girlfriend's house. Um, and then all of a sudden they said, well, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea to make this data available for everyone. So, <laughs> thanks. Well, I agree it's bad to make it, it's even worse to make it available to everybody. Basically, I don't think that allowing everyone to watch everyone makes it safe to have surveillance. Yeah, and, and what's really interesting is it's all about p policing for profit in many cases. You know, when your car expires, the registration expires, they don't just send you a renewal notice again to say, hey, you missed the renewal. What they do is they put police cars, especially in New Jersey, I know for a fact, they put police cars right outside on the road monitoring every car that goes by, and as soon as it triggers an expired registration by the LPRO lookup, they just, that guy just radios to another car to stop that vehicle and give that person a ticket. So it's just about using these records to just quickly generate more revenue rather than just another billing notice. So it's, it's really interesting how this data is being used already. And then, retain, and then retain for five years, for everybody. It's forever, it's for or, or more. It's vigilant data, it has it forever, guys. Sorry, I can't hear you at all. You're speaking very quietly, vigilant, it doesn't work. Vigilant data has that data forever, that's what the cops use. It's all one system in Virginia. That's what, that's what the states use, they hook to vigilant. Hi, uh, huge fan. Uh, I've got another license plate question. Uh, earlier you had said it's acceptable for an uh, automated license plate reader to use a database of known bad license plates. Would you say that license plates themselves are just a form, even without computers, are just a form of tracking? Well, they are. Well, not that I personally have a problem with license plates, right? I'm just curious for your take. They are obviously a system specifically for tracking. Uh, the question is, how much traffic tracking do we need? This, the, I, I never thought about the question of, should cars have to display a license plate? Uh, there are arguments in favor that are pretty obvious, and yet they do make it possible to track people, but in the past, the, the amount of tracking that was feasible to do was rather limited. There was no thought 40 years ago of trying to see every license plate that goes anywhere. It would have been ridiculously unfeasible. Oh, all right, thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, we can declare this over. I'd like to mention, though, that the free software movement needs lots of work and assistance from you. If you look at gnu.org slash help, you can see a list of the kinds of work we need. And some of the work is programming, but there are a lot of other kinds of work. Don't think that if you're not good enough to write big programs that you can't help us. You can help us with something that's not programming. There are many kinds of non-programming work we need and gnu.org slash help lists them. You can also join the Free Software Foundation. You can do that right here. I have cards you can fill out. You can pay your dues in cash. Or you can join through fsf.org, but then you'd have to pay digitally. By the way, one thing we need to do is set up uh, anonymous payments for e-commerce. I don't buy things on the internet. I just won't, because I buy things in a physical store and I pay cash. If I used a, a bank card, they would know who's buying what, and that is surveillance. So, it, 
we shouldn't stand for that. We have a system called GNU Toller. Look at toller.net for anonymous digital payments. It's not a currency, it's just a payment system. The payments are denominated in and some other currency, like it could be US dollars. Uh, and uh, it's anonymous for the payer, but it's not anonymous for the payee. So the amount, all the payments that a store gets are recorded, so this cannot be used to evade taxes. But it does give anonymity to the purchaser. For digital uh, purchases, that is, if what you want, if you're, what you're buying is a download or some service of some sort, that's all you need for anonymity. Uh, for buying physical goods, there's one other thing needed, which is an anonymous way to deliver the product to the purchaser. But essentially, society is moving in that direction. Amazon, I believe, has set up a lot of delivery boxes in places where products can be delivered. If that were split off from Amazon and made into some independent thing that it, any company could deliver to, then that would be everything you need. I have a question about, um, I'm, I'm a uh, Free Software Foundation donor, a member. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question about the the chief information officer appointed in this administration. Uh, they were a, a previous board member at Ernst and Young, like banks, and they also have ties to uh, virtualized systems, like that are proprietary and like you know you don't know what's going on. I, I have no idea who you're so talking about, question, or if it's one person or multiple people. Um, it, I'm, I'm just stating what's. Uh, transpired in this administration. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on uh, virtualization corporations such as VMware and the dangers that they are well, presenting. VMware makes proprietary software, right? Yes. And the, well, that's evil. Yes. And now that the legislation, yeah, it, I'm not disagreeing. The legislation now um, um, that's being proposed is to put all of the government systems into the cloud, and they keep on using this. There is no cloud. There is no cloud. Please, please don't computers. use that term. It's, it's only please. other people's computers, I know. Right, the I, point is, every time you speak as if there were a cloud, you're helping to confuse people. That is a marketing buzzword for the purpose of confusing and misleading people. People are supposed to think that the cloud is a place, and that because it's all so fuzzy, you don't need to ask, where is it really? So if someone proposes to keep data on a server, that ra should raise questions. Whose server? Where? What things will that server do with my data? What country is it in? What laws does it operate under? Yeah. And if various different computers will be involved, then I want to know the answer for each one of them. Yep. And you end up finding out with, with where the answer you would need is very complicated. That's because it's being done in a bad way. If you did that processing in your own computer, then if, it's, if the software is free, you'd have control over it. So systems such as Einstein used in ICT technology systems are I never heard of it. Yes, I know. They're something you really got to look deep down inside and see what they're taking now, current infrastructure, and putting it forward. So I just wanted to make uh, I'm afraid you're bringing up an area where I'm not an expert and I know I, nothing. To, I agree. We need to raise these questions that you just put forward. But what I'm saying is, though, the government, I say that the government should always fully maintain control over its own computing. Uh, it's an abuse for the government to run a non-free program because that means the government loses control of the computing it's doing for us. Its responsibility to the people is to maintain full control over the computing it does and not hand that control over to any private hands. 
So the government should never use a non-free program and it should never entrust its computing to a private server. No matter who they are. Doesn't matter. We don't even have to ask who owns the proprietary program or who owns the server. It's fundamentally wrong. So instead of getting distracted by the, all the details of those questions, we should insist that the government do things in such a way that those questions don't arise at all. Take a look at gnu.org slash government for more about this. Hi, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share an opinion uh, about the use of some of the technology you talked about today, like location services on iMonster devices that are used for um, non-spying purposes, like when someone that's been abducted or is going to be hurt is ended up becoming saved by law enforcement or something like that. Well, I'm not against telling somebody where you are sometimes. I'm not saying you shouldn't ever be allowed to tell people. I'm saying systems shouldn't be designed to track you. Uh, if you want help and you push some button that says help me, well then it's perfectly fine to, if it tells someone where you are. Um, but what about the times when it happens automatically as a result of the surveillance? I have no idea. You see, I don't have those devices. <laughs> Never happens to me. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Stallman. First thing I'd like to say, thank you for being the moral fiber holding together the technology industry and pushing us forward into a more open future for everyone. I don't want an open future. I want a freedom respecting future. Remember, open source is the slogan for rejecting our values. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, oriented around uh, ISPs and routing middlemen such as uh, Cloudflare who are developing and deploying open source technologies. I, will I really wish you, oh. I can't converse with you about free open technology. source because I'd be endorsing values that disagree with mine. Sorry, free technologies. But uh, what is your opinion on uh, the, uh, part, uh, the uh, offloading of traffic to these edge-based providers and breaking uh, protocols such as BGP and proper... Uh, okay, I don't know about those. I'm not, I'm not an internet wizard. I, I've heard of BGP, and that's all. I have nothing to do with it. Now, there's an FSF sysadmin who was here and may still be here, and I think he knows something about BGP, but I don't. Uh, my opinion of Cloudflare is that it blocks me from getting to sites because it sends me a capture that I can't answer because it depends on non-free JavaScript code or some, in some other way fails to work. Uh, now, I'm not necessarily against captures, but I wish they would do the capture in a way that works for people like me that are coming in through Tor and won't run a non-free program. Thank you for your time and your words. Now, that whether there's a deeper problem or issue with Cloudflare, I don't know. I haven't heard of one. Hi, Richard. Um, I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for your help 500 days ago. At the last hope, we created the privacy board here in New York. I reached out to you by email, and you sent me three layer rules that I should follow when I put this thing together. And I, I wanted to share them with you because I didn't see them on your slide, but I discovered that those three layer rules for every politician I met in New York, it was a light bulb. Which, I, I can't recognize, three what? Rules. Three layers? No, rules. Uh, I'm French, so my okay. English is not perfect. Uh, how do you say that in English? Rules. En français? Uh, Qu'est-ce que vous voulez dire? Rules. Are you, um, how do you call that? Rules. Oh, yeah, but you said, I heard a word before that. It sounded like three, three. layer rules. No, you gave me three. Three. Trois. Oui. Oh. Trois règles. Trois règles, merci. <laughs> <laughs> so you gave me those three rules, and I didn't see them on your slide. And I think for politician, when I met them, I, I gave them those three rules. And they all had the light bulb in their head, which was... Send them back to me. Or t I'm going to, to read them, them to you. Well, I, oh, Dada, okay. 
data that must be collected for some important civic reason and should be published uh, is in terms of the collection of data. So data that must be collected for some important civic reason and should be published. The second rule you gave me was data that must be collected for some important civic reason but should not be published. And the third one was data that should not be collected at all. Those were three rules that every politician could start a conversation from anywhere. And I think you should put them out there on your slide when you talk about the politics. But thank you very much for all the help. Thank you. Uh, the slides that I have are for free software talks. That's why I use them only for a while. And then when I started speaking about surveillance specifically, I didn't have slides. Uh, I can't draw. Uh, I can't draw my own slides. I have to talk with an artist to get them drawn. And I've been focusing on covering the whole of the free software topic with slides. Uh, you announce that, please, because, yeah, I'm basically done. Okay, uh, um, Dr. Stallman. <laughs> and would you like, you can go five more minutes here and then I take a break to the top of the hour. Are there any more questions? It looks like there are no more. Whoops. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what we have a uh, uh, possibility anyway, and it's really up to, to, to Richard well, how long he wants there. to stay. We have... Um, in the NES room, which is just up the hallway here. We reserved that for up to two hours, and, and I, I don't think we're expecting that you'll, that you'll spend that much time. But if people would like to have some small group discussion with, uh, um, with um, our guests, we can uh, facilitate that very easily. I think he's, his constitution appears to be up for it. That was a question, how long do you want to stick around? Right? But I think he's willing to uh, spend a little bit of time. And so what we would probably do is just take a, um, uh, you know, like a five or ten minute bio break and then convene there right around uh, the top of the next hour. Is that of interest to some people in the room? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Tell We're them where that. the room, tell them yeah. which room. Yeah. It's, it's the Nez room and it's just, I think people have uh, seen it. It's uh, almost opposite the uh, bathrooms up the hallway here. Okay. So uh, do you have any closing remarks? You're good? It's gone. <laughs> I think, I think we're done. So like, like I said, there's actually another talk in the NES room right now, so we'll have to give them a few minutes, uh, Richard, do you hear me? Well, there's another talk that's ending at the top of the hour. So we'll, uh, we'll convene there in a few moments. And he's, he's on site. Also afterwards, uh, Free Software Foundation, I think, if it, again, if, if uh, Richard's constitution holds, he'll be down in the FSF booth um, a little bit later on today. All right, thanks very much. Thanks for all the Q&A, and uh, thanks to, uh, to Dr. Solomon for rejoining us here at Hope with a brand new talk on surveillance. <laughs>